I'm William Andreessen, host of Speaking with Students, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows in the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Scott M. Hoffman. Scott was a witness to historical events concerning major mob families. He is also the author of the book, Inside, a fictional account of a man with two families, one with wife and kids and the other, the outfit. Awesome book. Awesome conversation. You're going to learn so much. Thanks for listening. And then, by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and uh, let review. Could you do that for me? You know, how about uh, say some nice words and uh, five stars? Hmm. <laughs> That'd be so cool. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. It's the education podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. Scott M. Hoffman was a witness to historical events concerning major mob families. He learned the inner workings from his dad, who loyally served the outfit for over 55 years, never spending a day in prison. Now 74, he is a native of Chicago. He is a graduate of Long Island University, Brooklyn, with a B.A. in journalism. For 35 years, he worked for the city of Chicago in the departments of purchasing and finance. Inside is his first published book. Scott Hoffman is not a name that is listed in any court records or historical documents about the Mafia. But he was in the room when meetings took place. He saw street enforcers and juice collectors deal out punishment, and he interacted with the real Goodfellas and Godfathers, including notorious gangsters Henry Hill, Tony Arcado, and Sam Giacana. Inside begins in 1956 with Jimmy Williams, a 47-year-old man with two families, his wife and two children, and the outfit. He's a good man, a good husband, and a good father, while at the same time, he is a physically powerful man who is well-respected as a conciliere in the outfit. He keeps his two lives separated, to the point his wife is unaware of what he does. Scott, thanks so much for being on the show. I can't wait to talk to you about your book, Inside, and uh, say hi to everyone. Oh, hello to you, Stephen, and good morning to all your listeners also. Well, glad to have you here, and... Uh, Let's let's start off by getting you to tell us why you decided to write Inside. Well, after retiring from the city of Chicago after 35 years, June 30th, 2012, the reason I decided to do it, Stephen, was the movies and television portray mob life in an you know, entertainment way. They do an excellent job, but there's a lot of things that they leave out. Either they don't know or they don't want to put them in. And... Uh, I tried that in, in my book, while it's fictional, it's the characters and events are composites of real people and real events, as I was eight years old when I started. And that's the uniqueness of the book. You're getting it through a child's eyes. But I saw things because I was there. I was on the inside with my father. That's awesome. So now the, the focus is on, you know, the title is Inside, and, and you and you Talk about the outfit. Can you share with us what the title means and what you're referring to as the outfit? Yeah, the outfit uh, basically is the title that the, the Chicago mob had for over 120 years. Okay. And because of that, that's how they were always known as the outfit. Now, Detroit, most people don't know. Detroit also, one of their names is the outfit. So it's not like uh, the outfit in Chicago had a copyright on that. But everyone knew him as the outfit. If you talked about Chicago mob, they would say the outfit. And in all the years, like I say, it's almost 120 years that the outfit has been around doing business. Wow, that's it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, think about how long it's lasted. I, so, what was it like to grow up with your dad in the mafia in the 50s and 60s in Chicago? And 70s also. 70s. <laughs> and even in the 80s, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, all the uh, other, other beyond that. Well, the, the, dif the difficulty, obviously, for me was my father had the plan for Las Vegas that led to the seven hotels and seven casinos. And as he told me, it was very difficult to get the plan through at first. He knew what uh, Mayor Lansky was doing in Havana after World War II with Batista 
was kind of like a, a mini Las Vegas. He wasn't involved in it, but he knew about it. And he'd always tell me the best plans are the ones that you steal. Okay, so he had a, a good idea of what was going on. Nice. But when he presented the plans to Paul Rica, Sam Giancana, and Tony Accardo, uh, they were all kind of lukewarm. He told me that uh, Paul Rica just kind of listened but didn't say anything. Sam Giancana said, well, we'll see, but his voice was very slow. And that wasn't Sam Giancana. And Tony Accardo said, no, it's a flash in the pan. What Bugsy Siegel did doesn't mean anything. It's not going to last. My father said, no, we can make it go. We can make a lot of money. And he said, uh, Tony Accardo says, well, how are we going to make money? And he says, first of all, he says, we'll take the dirty money from Chicago, we'll bring it to the casinos, we'll buy the chips, we'll, we'll cash the chips in, and we'll bring all the money back as clean money. It'll be all clean. Tony Accardo says, go ahead with the plan. And that's how it started. My father knew Jimmy Hoffa. He had, in fact, given Jimmy Hoffa money when Jimmy Hoffa first ran for his very first union position. So Jimmy Hoffa was a vice president at the time, first vice president. And in 1957, when Dave Beck, who portrayed himself as Mr. Clean, got indicted for embezzlement, Jimmy Hoffa took over. And my father talked to him, called him. And that's how things started. And I would just go into Las Vegas starting really in 1956 when I was eight years old, five times a year. And if my father, he would take me to the meetings and we'd leave on a Friday. I'd come home from grammar school. And he says, well, we're going to Las Vegas and uh, we fly back Sunday. But there were times when he didn't want me at the meeting, but yet he took me. And what he did was he arranged the weekend where my weekend mom was a mob prostitute. He would give her, say, I, he want to give her money to take me to a movie, to take me to dinner. And, and the girls, they were, you know, late 20s, maybe early 30s. So in a way, I could have been their son, and they never took the money. So one time, we're in a restaurant for dinner, and I was, I was about nine years old at the time when this happened. And uh, one of her clients, a John, comes up and points the finger at me and says, who's that? And she says, that's my date. Nice. So I, was, I didn't have to learn about sex education, as you could <laughs> understand. I was getting it firsthand. That's... I wouldn't have to watch the video. And, then, and that's how things progressed. My father's approach with me was he didn't groom me because other hosts have asked me, well, did he, was he grooming you? No. He wanted me to see everything, have my eyes open, and then make my own decision. Make my own decision. But he said, I want you to see everything. And when I look back at it, Stephen, while it was very difficult as a child, because I was still a child, had a child's brain, I did not have an adult's brain to figure out what I'm really seeing. But what I realized was when I would see guys who dropped out of high school at 16, 17 and joined the outfit, uh, that they just didn't know what, to, what they were getting into. They maybe had expectations, but they didn't know. By that age, I was a hardened veteran, okay? I had seen so much. So it was, it was difficult, very difficult. But that's my father's approach with me. And we would go over everything, every detail on everything, like a sports team practicing every day. We went over every detail of mob life and various other things related to mob life. We'd always go over personalities of people. So in a way, I was learning about life because we talk about the various personalities of the guy who's the backstabber, the guy who's moody, the guy who can't hold his liquor, and we'll go on and on. And then we'd get to one personality. And he'd always tell me, Scott, this is the one personality you always watch. The guy who sits at the end of the bar doesn't talk, drinks a beer. The guy who sits in a restaurant table by himself, doesn't talk to anybody, sits there, the quiet one. You always watch the quiet one because you never know what the quiet one is thinking. Everybody else runs their mouth. You know what they're talking. You know what they're about. The quiet one, you got to watch because all of a sudden that's when they spring into action because you don't know what's on their mind. That's awesome advice. <laughs> that's good stuff. So I you know, one of the things you're, as you're talking about this, I, I had wanted to ask you, uh, you know, at, at what point did you know that you did you notice that your father is not, maybe his world is pro not quite like um, other worlds, but, uh, you know, being watched by a prostitute might be the, a part of that as well as, uh, you know, the, the things he's talking to you about. But do, do you remember what really kind of made you go, this is different? 
Yeah, yes, Stephen, I did because again, I had to assimilate with my classmates and kids in the neighborhood. Okay, so I would see them. I never had birthday. I never had a bicycle. I never had a kid's life. I was an adult as a kid, basically. And but I would see uh, fathers maybe have a game of catch with their son or throw the football around in the fall. And I was seeing a different life. But yet I had to basically balance two lives. I was seeing a criminal life and I was seeing what would be considered a normal life. So I knew right from, you know, a very early age that things in my life were different. I never could talk to anybody about anything. My father would always say, if you talk to anybody, keep it vanilla, okay? Meaning just talk about how's your family, gee, how did the Cubs do or the Bears do, or keep everything normal, straight, that no one can come back at you, okay? So I could never talk to anybody what was going on with my life, but yet I was seeing what looked to me like normal families, normal activities. That's awesome. You know, uh, one of the things that you uh, mentioned is that, or that um, is something that you mentioned, is that you, at the age of nine, you witnessed a murder. What impact did that have on you? Well, it was, it was very difficult, obviously, because that day happened to be my birthday, and I thought I'm getting a birthday gift, and I never got birthday gifts. And uh, seeing it was not only, you know, very uh, revolting in a sense, let us say, but it was what happened afterwards because uh, it was all, it really wasn't even about a mob murder. That was the thing. It was about a banker who gave Sam Giancana bad financial advice. And you never gave Sam Giancana bad advice on anything. Okay. And basically uh, I was in the backseat of the car and Sam Giancana was the actual shooter and he killed the banker. This is when banking hours were till four o'clock. They didn't have branch banking or anything like that. So he comes back in the car, and the driver, who's Chuck English, is start has got the engine revved up, okay, because he's using a 22 with a silencer. And he comes back in the car, and he takes the silencer off, and he says, gives it to me, and says, uh, get rid of it, uh, happy birthday. And Chuck English says to him, Sam, do you really want to do this? And Sam Jean kind of says, yeah, the kid's got to learn. He's got to learn. So all of a sudden, I'm putting the silencer in my winter coat, right pocket, I'm trying to figure out what do I do with the silencer? How do I get rid of it? Wow. And I go home that night and we, you know, had the daily newspaper, Chicago Daily News, and I wrap it up and I, you know, put tape around it. And I figured, boy, I'm going to get out early in the morning before school. Okay. So I get out early in the morning and I go to a business a couple of blocks away who has a dumpster and I put the silencer in the dumpster. And then I come back home, and my, I was a very responsible kid even at that age, so they, I was given a key to the apartment. And I opened the door, and my father's standing there, and he says, how was your birthday? And I says, well, it was okay. He says, he gave you the silencer, didn't he? I said, yeah, he did. He says to me, well, happy birthday. So I'm walking on my way to school, and I see the Chicago Sun-Times is in a, a box, one of those boxes with the newspapers, and the front page is a picture of a guy laying in Cicero, who happened to be the banker, and Sam Giancana had put the guy's hat on his chest, okay? And that was the picture. So here I am going to school and, uh, you know, trying to assimilate in with the kids and go to elementary school, and you can imagine what was on my mind, not my schoolwork. I can imagine. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so... With with that, oh my gosh, um, yeah, that, that would have been an interesting day of school, I would think. Um, yes, yes, it was. It wasn't show and tell. I'll tell you that. <laughs> right, uh, you know, one of the, I I got to ask because you kind of you kind of we're talking about this just a little bit. Uh, I mean, was there any pressure to to basically make the next step to to follow in your dad's footsteps? No, there never was with them. There really never was. People have asked me that. I get that question, as you can imagine, quite a bit, of course. But it never was because he wanted to leave the decision up to me. He, he wanted me to decide. And when I was a senior in high school and I told him, Dad, I'm not going into the active life. I'm not, I'll, I'll be an observer, but I'm not going to be a participant. I want to go on to college. I was going to a junior college. 
because I'd asked my mother, you know, I said, Dad and I never talked about now what I'm going to do graduating high school. And, she, and I told her that I got the application for the junior college. I filled it out. I sent it. Because in those days, uh, junior college, the tuition was free. You just had to pay for the books. And she says, well, just tell him. I said, because I don't know how he's going to take it. So when I told him, and I said, um, you know, that I'm not going into the life, the active part, and people said to me, what's the difference between being an active and a part and watching as an observer? And I tell them when you're a participating participant, then you are doing criminal acts and you can be charged for criminal acts. As an observer, you're just looking at it. You're walking away. You can't be charged with anything because you haven't done anything. You know, they need evidence. It's not the court of public opinion. So when I told him, he said to me, Scott, he says, that's great. He said, if you want to go on and further your education and go to college, I'm 100% plus behind you. And then he said, the worst thing a parent can do is to force a kid into something he doesn't want to do. And 30 years later, he's going to come back and say, Dad, you forced me into doing this. He said, you've made the decision. It's your decision. I'll support you all the way. That's awesome because I could – it's because it's, it's – I can imagine the, you know, the the ease of it would be to really quickly just suck you into it. <laughs> and well, the normal the normal uh, way was sons of a father or nephews of an uncle. They went into it right away because you see the difference was they in, in mob families, no nothing was talked about, so these kids never knew. They never knew what li the life was about. They never knew what organized crime was about. They never knew nothing, okay, because it was never talked about in the house. So it was very easy for them to imagine something glamorous and looking good and something that they wanted to go into and would follow. And their fathers or uncles, whoever in their life, would encourage it, okay? They would encourage them to go in. And, uh, you know, so it was a big difference for me because my father – like I say, he left it open for me. It's just like I never really dated any uh, wise guy's daughters or their nieces. Because what happens, Stephen, is this. If you're dating uh, what we call a little Madonna, okay, they've been spoiled by their father or their uncle. And uh, when you start dating them, if you start to get a little bit serious, the father or the uncle is going to call you down in the basement and says, well, sure, we know you. You're writing for the uh, Oak Park Times, but uh, you're not making much money, are you? Okay, and that's the hook to say, I want you to come into the life to support my daughter or to support my niece. That's how it starts. And guys jump at it because they see the money, they see everything, and it's true, you know, you're going to make more illegal money, but you're also, the consequences are much higher than going to work for a newspaper and being a reporter or running a podcast like you're doing. You don't have to worry about Big Louie or Guido coming to make a home visit to talk to you about something. Yeah, not at all. That's uh, especially if, uh, it, I could only imagine going, it, especially if they decided that you were a little too forward or um, with their, their daughter or niece or whatever, or, sure. uh, or broke her heart. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, very much so. I mean, there was, it was one mobster. It's really, they never were able to charge him with anything. He had broken up with the girl. And um, he said, well, let's talk it over. I guess maybe he had second thoughts. And they met in uh, a forest preserve. And he strangled her to death. Okay. Wow. That was because she was not going to go out with him. She told him she wasn't going to go out with him because he told me. He said, I'm not going out with you. You go your way. I go my way. And she thought that was the end of it. No, with him, that was not the end of it. Because you have to remember, uh, by the age of 14, my father explained to me what a sociopath and a psychotic was. So now I knew the medical terminology of the crazy guys I'm seeing and the craziness they're doing. Because I always knew they were crazy, but medically, I never knew the terms. Now I would know the terms. So now I knew. And this guy was very psychotic, involved in about 35 or 40 murders, but extremely psychotic. I mean, who in the front of a judge would call a, an assistant U.S. attorney a uh, homosexual in court, okay? Only someone who's very psychotic. 
So yes, you had to be careful of that. I can imagine the, uh, especially if you started getting friendly, it's quite possibly that, you know, friendly is seen differently by, uh, the other person is, you know, if they didn't saw you as a threat or something, I guess is my point. Well, what would happen was my father would always say to me, always remember, these are just associates. They are not your friends. They will turn on you just very, very quickly. As quickly as you can turn a light switch on, that's why they will turn on you. And he'd always tell me, you got to remember, guys in the life, 90% are lies and 10% is BS. So he's think of this. He said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. So, Stephen, if your mother is still alive and your listeners, if their mothers are still alive and they say they love you, check it out. Because you can't always trust even mom. And Mother's Day was the only free day in mob life. The only free day. Thanksgiving, I was out with my father collecting money. Christmas Day, he'd wait till 1 o'clock so the kids could see their presents. And then we would start going out to collect money. So Mother's Day was the only day that was free that no one got beat, no one got killed. But at 12.01 a.m. on Monday, the action started. Wow. Wow, that, you know, going back to my question before, when did you know when uh, your father's life is a little different? I, I think all those are good signs. That's uh, yeah. Yes, I think those are examples. It's very much so. It, it, okay, so your father was in the mob for over 55 years, yet he never did time in jail. Uh, how'd that happen? Well, basically, my father, he was never too interested in speaking much in a restaurant because he always felt there'd be a bug under the table. So he would use churches. OK, and he would he would at the churches, he would make phone calls out of them. He would have meetings with guys with churches and the priest. He would either give him five dollars or if they were a drinker, he'd get him Jack Daniels, Johnny Walker Red, Dwyer's. OK, he would use uh, Catholic cemeteries. He'd use uh, synagogues. He'd use Jewish cemeteries. That's where he would meet with people. And he'd always tell people if we're going to meet in a Catholic cemetery, we don't have to worry about anybody listening, because if they're listening, they're not going to be speaking. So he, he, he'd use pay phones. He would have guys, he would give a guy, a, a, tell him a specific pay phone where to call from, and they would, the calls would be made to pay phones. I'll never forget Mar, uh, Sidney Korshak, <laughs> Mr. Korshak, who was a lawyer and was out in Las Vegas and had control of the unions. I'd see him one day walking around with a roll of dimes. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Korshak, uh, why do you have all those dimes? He said, I learned that from your father because you never know when there's a tap on the line. So I always use pay phones. Nice. Nice. So yeah, that's how he kept out. That's how he kept out. And yeah. he always was a guy who had a plan. He'd always tell me, you got to be three steps ahead of anybody. And I say, dad, isn't the saying two steps? And he said, no, if it's two steps, that means you lose a step. You're only a step away from them grabbing you. And he said, in the game of life, you always want to be the hunter never the game, always the hunter, never the game. So yes, he was, uh, as, as FBI agents would tell me, or the G as they're always called, anyone with law enforcement was the G, the government. They'd always say, your father never fit the mold. And there were many FBI agents and I met with 22 of them. They were retired in October 2016 at a restaurant with their wives, girlfriends. And they said, one guy, Tommy O'Connell, an agent said to me, you know, when I started and was assigned to Chicago, I told your father, I'm going to get you. And your father said to me, Tommy, he says, I'll be sending you your retirement card, but I'm not sure that's really going to happen. And Tommy said to me, you know, your father was right. I never could catch him. Yes. I like that. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Especially for someone who set out to. Yeah. You have to remember because we had uh, all these, uh, I was with my father who paid off corrupt politicians, corrupt judges corrupt law enforcement. We had two FBI agents on the payroll. Okay. So when um, my father had to go before a grand jury, the, one of the agents on the payroll said the taps were not legal. Okay. So my father's in the jury room uh, with the grand jury and he says, your honor, can we speak? So the judge and the U.S. assistant U.S. attorney were the only ones there because in a grand jury room, you, you're attorney cannot be present. He can be outside, but he can't be present. And so the judge sent the jury out of the room and he says, well, what do you want to talk about? Because my father said, I don't think we should speak in front of a jury. 
And he said, ask the AUSA, meaning the assistant U.S. attorney, uh, if he got if he has paperwork, he can show you that a federal judge signed off on a wiretap. And he asked the ASA, where's the paperwork? And he said, well, an FBI lawyer approved it, okay? And the judge said, that's no good. He says, he said, I want to see a federal judge signing it. So the AS, ASA told the judge, well, we're no longer going to have a grand jury because he knew he wouldn't be able to get a federal judge to sign off because you have to be very clear with a federal judge on a wiretap. And what it was, the FBI agent had illegally wiretapped, set up the wiretaps. It was all illegal. So he, uh, the judge dismissed my father, said, Mr. Hoffman, you're free to go. And that was the end of uh, that grand jury. It's, it's... And it only came about uh, because of the tip that he got from the agent who was on our payroll. He was a friend. We're all, everyone's a friend. If he was speaking to you today, he said, oh, Stephen's my friend. Nice. Nice. That's, that's wild. That's uh, it, something else. Cause that's a, that's a good, good track record there to be able to make it uh, those years and uh, not, and not get nabbed um, or caught yeah, up in yeah. other people's. Well, he was always looking. He was always, he'd always say it's a chess game. He says, when you're going up against the G, it's always a chess game. And he'd tell agents that when they'd come to see him, he'd always say, you're going to make a move. Then I'll make a move. You're going to make a move. I'll make a move. And they'd always say, well, our move is going to be the final. And my father says, well, you got about 25 years or so. Let's see what happens in your career. And when they retired, he'd send them a card. Congratulations. He'd send them 100 bucks in the card. Congratulations on your excellent career and your retirement. Awesome. And he'd send it to the FBI office. I love it. When they retired. <laughs> love it. Awesome. Hey, all right. When Let's talk about some other things that happened in your life. Sure, go ahead. When, when you were 12, you met Marilyn Monroe. Could you talk about how yes. it happened and what happened? Well, originally, uh, she had just filmed her last movie, Misfits, and that was with Clark Gable. And uh, after the filming, it wasn't that long afterwards, Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe were supposed to go out on presentations, you know, make the tour and everything. And Clark Gable died of a heart attack. So in uh, February of, of uh, to, uh, um, I'm going to say, what was it, February of 1961, uh, she had been in New York with her former husband, Arthur Miller, who was a very famous playwright. And they got divorced. My father told me they got divorced on January 25th, 1961, in Juarez, Mexico. It was a quickie. And he had been the screenwriter. And that was not really his forte, but he was the screenwriter of the movie. And John Houston was the director. So after the premiere in New York, she came to Chicago. And she was at the Blackstone Hotel. And the Blackstone Hotel was one of the hotels only on Saturday night, this was, where there was mob prostitution going on. Okay. So when I met her, uh, the first thing I said to her, uh, I'm Mr. Kelly. Now, my grandfather's name was Kellowitz. But they all called him Mr. Kelly. He was a portrait photographer. And he was the the photographer who shot Marilyn Monroe for the 1953, July 1953, first edition of Playboy magazine. And the reason Hugh Hefner wanted my grandfather was not only because of his reputation as a portrait photographer, but also in those days, there was no airbrushes, okay? There was no airbrushes. So by hand, he put in the skin tones, okay? And so when the uh, pictures were developed, you can see everyone look natural. If you were to look, you can go online and look at the magazine cover, and you'll see Marilyn Monroe's face, the skin tones, the arm, the arm skin, even the little bit of the breast that's showing. Everything looks will look natural to you. So he had that talent, but he wasn't that interested in doing it. He said, "That's not my type of work." He told my mother, and uh, Hugh Hefner, who didn't have much money went to see his father. His father, Glenn, was an accountant and gave him $50. And that was a lot of money in 1953. So that's when he called my grandfather and he said, I would like you to shoot Marilyn Monroe and I'm willing to pay you $50. And then he wanted her to, wanted my grandfather to pay, to uh, shoot Marilyn Monroe for the centerfold. And my grandfather says, no, I'm not doing any of that. I don't do that. You know, he's, I don't want to say moralistic, but that just, he liked to do families. And, and if you came in with your wife for a wedding, 
that was what he did, okay? He wasn't interested in that other, other type of things, other type of photography. So Marilyn Monroe, he, he tells you have to have her here on a you know, date at 7.30 in the morning. My grandfather always, when he would shoot somebody, you know, like that, and he shot Jane Mansfield, he'd always want him to come in early before they got tired. So she doesn't come in until 12.30. And she's telling me this. She says, your grandfather was very tough, but he was very good. And, and so the first day when I showed up at 1230 with my people, he said, go home. And, and she says, why? He said, I want you here at 730. I have a husband, a, a bride and groom that they're getting married and they want to take pictures at one o'clock before their marriage, okay, to include in their album. And they would get married, I think, in maybe about two weeks. And he said, they have an appointment scheduled. I'm not going to infringe on their time, just like I wouldn't have infringed on yours. You had an appointment. You didn't show up, leave, get out of here. So, of course, she leaves, and her road manager calls Hugh Hefner. And Hugh Hefner says, calls my grandfather, says, look, can she come tomorrow? I'll have her there at 7.30. And he says, all right, but that's the last chance. He said, I'll give her one chance, and that's it. Find somebody else. I'll give you your money back. The next day, she was there at 7.30. He spent about two and a half hours shooting her, and they left on good terms. But she said, your grandfather was good. She said, he was probably right, but he was good, you know. And she had had problems on the set when she did the Misfit with, uh, my father had told me, with uh, liquor and pills. So she was already starting to go into a different direction. But we continued talking. She told me about her childhood, which her mother was a schizophrenic, who was in and out of uh, asylums. And when she was born, she was put right into a foster home. And she was in 12 consecutive foster homes and an orphanage. And when she was finally able to locate her uh, biological father, he said, I'm married, I, I have a family, talked to my lawyer, and he walked away from her. He would have nothing to do with her. And you could see when she was telling me that, I could see, you know, you could see it in her face. So then she says to me, how old are you? And I says, I'm 12 and a half. She says, yeah, you're 12 and a half going on 40. She says, you've lived a thousand lives. And I said, maybe a thousand one. And we spoke for about almost an hour and a half, I would say, close to an hour, 45 minutes. That's awesome. That That's, was an experience. I can imagine. It, it, all, all different kinds of experiences that you're having here. This is incredible. Yes. I, you know, one of the things I got to um, ask you, let's, let's go back to your book for a minute. We got, um, sure. so, so uh, why would my listeners want to read Inside? What, what, tell, give us the commercial for it. Well, the reason they'd want to read Insight is the variety of stories that are in there, and they will see mob life in different aspects of how things went, how things worked. And I think it will, everyone that has read my book so far, and I've sold a little over 5,200 books, has always told me the same thing, that this should be a movie, and it keeps me interested. And I was in a restaurant in Chicago. It was actually in Skokie. This was when my book, for about a year after my book came out. So it was, my book came out in March of 2016. So it was in 2017. And there was a couple and they had bought the book and I was signing it and we were talking about it. And there was a guy standing right next, almost next to me in the restaurant. And he says to me after I finished, this sounds very interesting, but I haven't read a book. And I said, well, when was the last time you read a book? And he said, 38 years ago when I graduated high school. And they said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the information. If you don't like it, I'll reimburse you for the cost. So I gave him all the information. I see him about three weeks later. He says, Mr. Hoffman, you brought the book. He said, would you sign it? I said, sure, I'll sign the book. I got a pen. He says, you know, I got the book on a Friday when I came home from work. I couldn't stop reading. I read it all weekend. So I said, well, now you'll be able to read more books. You don't have to wait 38 years. Nice. But yeah, that's what the book is. Uh, and I feel once people start reading it, They'll get wrapped up in it. That's what people have told me, you know, that they found it very interesting, especially it was very detailed, especially the part where I'm talking about Italian families. I spent a lot of time in Italian homes, what went on. And also, uh, you know, a little bit about the, the drug plan that my father had, but he never bothered with these people uh, because there were two other guys who had tried selling drugs in the 60s and they had no plan. They got caught. So they weren't real interested. And he had a good plan. Even the FBI, when I met with them, the agents, they said, yeah, your father's plan was good. And basically, I'll just give you a highlight of it, was he was going to use women as the mules. Women were going to be the distributors. He'd have them dressed up in business clothes. They looked like they were going to work. And they were going to be the ones that would be given briefcases to drop off. 
with the narcotics in there. So yeah, they said it was, even the agent said, we never would have thought that women would have been involved because in, in the life, in mob life, it's macho, okay? It's not, uh, not something that uh, women would be pursuing. Gotcha. Hey, you know, one of the, um, one of the things I got to, you know, over time, uh, why, I mean, why do you think that people get so fascinated with, uh, with the life? What, why, why do you think there's, it continues to be something well, the people reason want to being, know? You know, Stephen, the reason being is people don't lead that type of life and they don't know anything about that type of life. And it's glamorized to make it look like, wow, this is really glamorous. You have the power, you have the money, you can do what you want. And that was true to a certain extent, but it wasn't always true because guys were convicted on charges, guys went away. The kids were told you, either your father's going to college or he's got an out of town job. So for 10 years or 20 years, he would have an out of town job, he was going to college and it's glamorized and people don't know anything about the life. See, that's why I titled the book Inside because people don't really know anything about it. Uh, I was at, I remember, one of my earlier uh, in-house uh, presentations uh, where I was in person, and this was probably, oh, I would say middle of 2017. I always have, the, after I complete it, I always allow for a question and comment time. You know, and, and uh, people, they want, they want me to keep on going, you know, they go on hours with me, go on days or years. And so a guy stands up and says, Mr. Hoffman, I have a question. I said, sure, go ahead. He says, no one on my block is from the mafia. No one in my family has been involved in the mob. I don't know anybody in the mob. So w what's going on with this mob? And there was an elderly lady. I'll never forget, she sat to his right and just gave him a couple of taps on the arm, very lightly. And he turned to look at her, he was standing, she was sitting, and he said, Jimmy Hoffa, Teamsters. And he sat down, he said, now I understand. Okay, now I understand. Because basically she was telling him, the Teamsters could shut down any city they wanted. Because just imagine if you're going to the grocery store and the grocery store, the truck didn't deliver this. You go, say, to a doctor's office and you're going to get medicine. Well, he doesn't have it. You go to, oh, say, a Walgreens, a pharmacy. Well, the truck didn't deliver it. These are all Teamster drivers, okay? And if something is going on, they're told, call in sick that day. And all of a sudden, everything is shutting down. So this is why in politics, especially in Illinois or say the Democratic Party, they always get very, very close to the unions. They always want union support. Even the current governor, who's a billionaire, J.B. Pritzker, is worth about three or four billion dollars. He still tries to curry favor with the unions. Okay. So after that lady said that, it kind of clicked into the guy. Well, oh, now I know what he's talking about. Gotcha. This is, uh, you know, it is, it's, it's an interesting world. And, uh, especially with the, you know, the, uh, getting the power on your side or making the, the donations where they need to be, or the, you know, having the conversations that need to be had, you know, and it's, it's, uh, and, and I, and you can tell how it, it really kind of lends itself to those stories or those, uh, movies that, uh, and books and things like this that people, you know, think or might think is, is how it works. I, you know, one of the things that, uh, I got to get you to talk about is, and you mentioned this a little bit, I mean, you know, the outfit is portrayed certain ways, uh, you know, movies, books, um, they all paint images, but can you just kind of give it a, a jolt of what it really was like, as opposed to what these movies did? Well, the, the, really the big difference was everything. The first conversation of the day is about movie, money. The last conversation of the day is about money. Everything is based around money. And uh, I'll give you an example. And I talk about it in my book using the fictional character, Eric Lido, who is a homosexual. Now, normally, uh, if a boss, Capriani, uh, a, a capo, is a homosexual, let us say, uh, then he would be killed. He'd be whacked. Or there's another term besides those, besides the term whack, and that's give him his receipt. So, Stephen, if you and your listeners are in a, a store and the clerk says, uh, sir, would you like your receipt? Uh, you get those feet going to the door and do that Olympic sprint and get out of there because that's basically telling him to kill somebody. 
Nice. And uh, so if a boss, uh, because the reason being, they never wanted a boss to show weakness. So if a boss was gay, uh, that was very, very bad. It was showing weakness. Now, a street crew member, someone part of the street crew, if he was gay and he was a good earner and he was bringing in money, then he'd, he'd be told, keep it off the street. They wouldn't like it. They didn't like it, but keep it off the street because he's bringing in money. And another thing that the public doesn't know, actually two things. First of all, if a guy's working as a juice collector and collecting money, gambling money and uh, interest on loans from loan sharks, he gets 50%. Okay, so that's why these guys are hustling on the street. Okay, this is why they're going to use a baseball bat, uh, brass knuckles. I saw uh, bicycle chains. I saw people beat with two by fours, a golf club, police baton. Yeah, this is why they're reacting that way because they get half the money they bring in. And also, if there's a contract put on someone, unless a number is put on someone's head, like in a case like Joe Pistoni, the FBI agent, the Donnie Brasco movie, who I met before I even went undercover at a wedding. Otherwise, you, that's part of their job. They don't get extra money when so, a contract is put on someone, okay? There's no extra money. It's considered part of their job responsibility. But these are things, you know, that the public doesn't know. So this is, you know, some of the differences. And, and, and they're not paranoid like the movie Goodfellas you know, they're concerned about the Jeep, but they're not paranoid like uh, Henry Hill who was a real problem uh, in the uh, witness uh, prevention program. He was a real, real problem. And in fact, they had to kick him out eventually, but they were not that paranoid about it, but they were concerned, sure, they were concerned about it. But again, everything was always about money. And with uh, guys in the life, everything is first class. Everything is first class. If you if you were to come in, Steve, and, and you said to my father, uh, you know, gee, I'd love to go to a Cubs game. He'd get you tickets in a box seat. You wouldn't be sitting in the bleachers. You'd be getting a ticket in the box seat, okay? And he'd have food there prepared just for you, okay? It wouldn't be sold to the public. It would be just prepared for you. And this is how they worked. When they would date women, this is how it was with women. Everything was first class. So... You know, like I say, it was uh, just a different life, but not everything is always shown in a movie or on television. It's got to be entertainment. And some of the stuff, like I talked about in my book about what happened with the pregnant woman when the, a juice collector was looking for her husband, I had to water that down. I had to water that down because I said to myself, if I put in exactly what happened to her physically, and she was very obviously pregnant, maybe at least eight months along, seven, eight months, very obvious, it would have nauseated the readers because I don't know if the readers could handle that. I was very considerate that I don't think they could handle seeing what really went on. And this was because all about money, looking for the husband. So yeah, there, there were differences. That's for sure. Gotcha. I appreciate you talking about that. It's, you know, it, it is interesting because like, you know, I, I think some of them, some of the movies, uh, and, and it's been popularized in some long-running TV shows and things like that. And um, what do you what do you think? Something that uh, they typically get wrong, and why do you think they get it wrong? Well, I think you know they get they get stuff wrong that would be um, let us say physically nauseating to people. Okay. You got to remember, uh, like, for example, when I was 11 years old, I saw a guy's hands cut off. And he wasn't dead at that point yet. His hands were cut off because he owed money. And when I was 12 years old, the same guy in the life decapitated a guy. And that guy wasn't dead yet either. And so the thing is, you know, they have to make it glamorous. They got to make it look like it's something that you really want to see and would want to go to. And if they put in stuff that was not always true, in other words... Uh, for example, and I talk about it in Inside, if uh, a guy goes away, okay, to a federal facility, let us say, guys are just looking for his business. If he if he was a juice collector, whatever it was, a bookie, and the wife and kids, there's no money coming in, basically. Uh, that's why my father would always try and get him money, do things for him, because he was very handy. My father could do electrical work, carpentry plumbing, we upholster furniture. You always tell them if you have a problem in the house, call me first, call me first. 
because what would happen would be to say the wife, say you were in the life, Stephen, and your wife went to see your boss who you reported to, okay, who you had to pay tribute. And paying tribute means you have to kick money up. Maybe it was 10%. That's what paying tribute means. And someone says, oh, we got to pay tribute. And say they went to your boss, okay, and said, you know, gee, you know, I got to pay the mortgage. I got a Catholic school tuition coming up. Uh, my daughter is going to the junior prom. She needs a dress. The boss would say, you got a money maker? Go on the street and use it. That's what they would tell them. Go on the street and use it, meaning prostitute yourself. Take your body on the street and prostitute yourself. They wouldn't give any money. They wouldn't do anything. It wasn't like this business. So they're taking care of people. No. The day the guy was away was the day that there's business. And when he's got out of prison, they weren't educated. So they went back to the life. I mean, we had a few guys that didn't go back. Okay. And not everybody went back because no one's putting a gun to your head to go back, but they went back because they didn't know anything else but the life. So they went back to it, but the family suffered. They suffered a lot. A lot of things had to be done because there was no money coming in. It was hard. It's hard on the families. I can imagine. And they don't show that. <laughs> yeah, not at all. It's usually the opposite. Yeah. They make it look like it's great. All right. That's uh that's something else. I, all right. So, Let's let's talk about some historical things here because you mentioned one of them. You, um, yes. There's there's the historical figure that uh, was a big, ultra lifelike uh, named Jimmy Hoffa. Um, oh yes, yes. So what do you think happened to him? Well, the problem with Jimmy Hoffa was that he wanted the presidency back. Okay, he wanted the presidency back. You have to remember that I had gone in with my father. See. Nixon wanted $300,000 to pardon him. That's what it was all about. And when my father got the call from Josephine, his wife, um, I went with my father and we went to Bethesda, Maryland. Actually, it was a Jewish cemetery, my father found out. And we met the bag man. And the bag man was a guy, you recognize the name right away because he was involved in Watergate. He was the guy who organized the plumbers. E. Howard Hunt, he was a former CIA guy. He was a very cold guy, he's in a trench coat, very cold appearance, cold personality. My father said, do you wanna count the money? No, he says, if it's not there, we'll be in touch. And he took the briefcase and he left. But the deal was that Nixon would pardon him, but he could not go back to the union. And that wasn't Jimmy Hoffa, okay? That wasn't him, he wasn't gonna to tolerate that. So when he got home, he called my father and he says, once I get the presidency back, we'll talk. Because he was always uh, interested in doing things for his guys. He'd always refer to the union, his guys. And my father first talked to him about the seven hotels, which would be the seven hotels, seven casinos, the loan. It was always, what are my guys going to get out of it? What's gonna, what are they going to do? How are they going to benefit by it? And the loan was supposed to be a 10-year loan at 2% interest. My father paid it back in five years. Okay, paid the loan back in five years. It was like a Lee Iacocca when he paid the loan back, okay? And, uh, but Hoffa was not going to quit. That was his personality. You couldn't just come home and just take care of yourself, you know, do things, stay away from things. No. And um, that's where everything really developed because Frank Fitzsimmons was the union president. He was mobbed up, and he wasn't going to give up the position. And that's where things really started to go bad for Jimmy Hoffa really, really started to go bad that way. And they had the plans already made for him, what was going to happen. And he's disappeared, okay? I mean, it's a cold case. He's disappeared. They haven't found him, but he's disappeared. And I will tell you this. The agent in charge of the Detroit office never wanted the case. He never wanted the case. He said, let the Michigan State Police handle it because he felt we're just going to be spinning our wheels and we will never be able to find the answer of what really went on. And that's really the truth. Because about, oh, it must have been 15, 18 years later, maybe close to 20 years later, the lead agent, Robert Garrity, had got my name and number, and he called me, and he introduced himself. He was the lead agent on the case, the FBI agent. And he introduced me and he, to himself, me, and he said, I understand you know something about the Hoffa murder. And I says, probably nothing more than you. He said, well, what do you mean? I says, well, you interviewed Frank Sharon, right? And that was the Irishman. I knew him 
And he was a BSer. I'll tell you, he was a BSer. And I said, um, I bet he probably told you that he killed Jimmy Hoffa and he's going to take you to the house and show you where the blood is. And Garrity started laughing. He says, are you sure you weren't assigned to the case? And I said, no, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, you tell me, Mr. Garrity. And he said, no, you're right. So that's why I discounted him as one of the people who was involved in the murder. But uh, like I say, it, uh, it's still an open case. So if any of your listeners went into Jimmy Hoffa, the FBI in Detroit, I'm sure, would be very interested in meeting him and seeing him. Thanks for talking about that. I, you know, it's, he was a larger life character, and, uh, and uh, there's quite a few people who believe that uh, he might be part of the foundation in the giant stadium out there in, uh, in New York. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe so. I don't believe. I know. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, the Giacalone brothers, Tony Giacalone, there was his brother Vito known as Billy Jacks. Uh, and uh, Giacalone and Tony had met with um, somebody probably about two days before the disappearance and that somebody was a guy I'll tell you his name was Jimmy Q Jimmy Corzano and he owned a incinerary an incinerator because in those days they were still burning garbage in Chicago they still had incinerators but because of pollution they had to stop and he was talking to him, okay? And Jackalonis were the type of people, they would tell 40 people 40 different stories. So that's why they, you've had 43 investigations by the FBI. This is what they would do. They were known for that. And I would say my opinion was that after the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, that his body was cremated. That's why he was talking to Jimmy Q, okay? They would get him the body. And I'm not saying they were the shooters, because I believe it was Provenzano, there's a good case for Provenzano's guys that were the shooters, okay? Gotcha. But I don't, I don't, I don't really buy this business of well, he's here, he's there. But this is the Jackalones. They probably told 43 people, <laughs> yeah, this is what happened to him. Never said, oh, I know, I know. Because in mob life, you tell one person, oh, I know the story, I know the story. And with my father, he used to always put up speed bumps. When he get the order, say from Sam Giancana, on somebody, he'd always say, Sam, look. Let me check out, make sure we have all the facts. Just give it 20, give me 24, 48 hours. And if you still want the order, I'll still carry it out for you. Okay. And he's Sam Giancana, who knew my father for such a long time, said, Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Give me the information. My father always was a guy, you gotta have the information, you gotta know. He said, because everyone's gonna run their mouth and tell you a story. So you gotta know. And I believe that Jack Alonis, who were good for that, uh, they they spread the word and everybody thought they knew where Jimmy Hoff is, and that's why there's been 43 investigations of the disappearance, okay? That's wild. That's, that's, that's wild. And it makes a lot of sense, too. I, all right, one, one last historical one. So what do you, what do you think yeah. about President Kennedy? Well, that all, that all started back with the Cal Neva Casino in South Lake Tahoe. That whole story of how the Kennedys and the outfit got together went way back. That was the beginning. Okay, that was the beginning. And that's a very, very long story, which you would need a lot more time, maybe 10 years or so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you would need a lot more time. That's how things started. That, and it was all about the 1960 election, obviously. That's how things started. But things went bad from that point on. And the person that caused it all to go bad was Robert Kennedy. It was all on Robert Kennedy. Okay, his brother was killed. Not, I remember the day he was killed. Okay, that day was my birthday, November 22nd, 1963. And I asked my father, I came home, and you know, it was a quiet day. They sent you home from school, everyone was sad. And it was, you know, a sad day, obviously, for family, you know, his family and his brothers, you know, and such. And I said to my father, Well, what do you think? And my father said to me, eh, Maybe we killed the wrong Kennedy. And that's what the problem, that's what it was all about, to look, get rid of Robert Kennedy as attorney general, because he turned on not only the outfit, but he turned on all mob families. All of a sudden, he was going to become a mob buster, like how Tom Dewey was in the late 40s when he was going after Charles Lucky Luciano. All of a sudden, he's going to be the big mob buster, okay? And every, every promise that he made of what they would do if they got elected was never done. They're all related to Cal Neva, all related to the casino 
the South uh, uh, Tahoe Airport, which was like a airport for corporate uh, jets to come in. It was very small. The infrastructure, everything started around Calneva and it ended around Calneva. And it's a big, big story how it really started and what really went on. But it was Robert Kennedy who reneged on everything. And that's what caused the problem. That's what caused the problem, especially at the point where he started to form these strike forces. And that's what gave Sam G. and kind of the push, the, the, the subject matter. Because he Chicago always had a seat on the Mafia Commission. They still have a seat on the Mafia Commission, but the Genovese family will represent him. And he was able to push the commission to give the order on John Kennedy. Now, I'm not saying anyone killed him from the mob, because you have to look at the final ballistic reports. Because the FBI always said, well, they had all the bullets. In the initial report, all their bullets came from Oswald's rifle. So if there was another shooter, where's the other bullets? Okay, because they didn't know what rifle Oswald was using. It was my father who had known Jack Ruby. That's another long, long story. My father ultimately was, got a call from Jack Ruby, wanted a rifle. And my father bought the rifle at Klein's Sporting Goods Store in downtown Chicago on Madison Street for $12.99 and had it mailed to Jack Ruby. And that's how the FBI was able to track that where the gun came from. But they didn't know anything more about where the gun came from. And my father didn't know what the gun was for. He had, Ruby had asked him, because Ruby was from the same neighborhood. He had left Chicago. His real name was Rubenstein. And he had left Chicago in 1949 for Dallas. But my father had gotten a job on, in the south part of the Loop of Chicago, which is downtown is known as the Loop because the train goes around it, on South State Street. And we hear Frank Sinatra sing the song Chicago, he'll talk about that great street, State Street. When you go on the south end of South State Street, almost out of the loop, there was uh, peep shows, there was uh, strip clubs, there was everything related to mob activity, you know, for the mob. It was all pornographic stuff, bookstores. And it was run by a guy for, uh, by the name of High Levin, High Shout Levin, who had a big booming voice. That's why they called him Shout. And he basically reported to Tony Accardo with the pornographic things that were going on besides the strip club. And my father had gotten Ruby a job there. So he had worked in a strip club and then he left Chicago. But he would still, you know, occasionally he would still call my father. But my father had no idea why he wanted the rifle until the shooting. And that day was one of the day my father knew what was going on. He didn't talk anything more about it other than maybe we killed the wrong Kennedy. That was, that was the only thing he said, which in a way... Turned out because Ramsey Clark, Kennedy resigned as attorney general right away because he never got along with Lyndon Johnson at all. He didn't even want him on the ticket. It was the father that put him on the ticket, okay, because he said, we need Johnson for Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia. And that's where Johnson campaigned. And they, Kennedy carried those states. So he resigned right away, and Ramsey Clark was put in. So I said to my father, when Ramsey Clark, his father, Tom Clark, is a United States Supreme Court justice. Don't you think he'll be just as hard? And he says, no, he won't be hard. He'll, be, he'll just do his job, but he's got no vendetta. He's got nothing, no ax to grind. He's not looking to get elected to anything, like Robert Kennedy was looking to go higher. So that's the way the story kind of went, but it's a lot more, a lot more to it. Well, I appreciate that's you. That's how it started. Gotcha. That, that makes sense, and I appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, it. it it, interesting times that they were and uh, um, and the impact that they've had since then. So, uh, Scott, uh, before we go, because we're, we're about to wrap up, uh, can you tell everyone where they could uh, get a copy of your book and uh, sure. um, any other information? My book, sure. Uh, my book is sold on Amazon. And if you put in my name, Scott, S-C-O-T-T, middle initial M, you have to put in that middle initial because there's other Scott Hoffmans who are authors. And my last name, Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, and the title inside, you will see my book. It's sold as a paperback and it's also sold as Kindle because I've had some people who like to read it on their commute, on a train. And I have some people who have bought it as, on Kindle besides buying it as the paperback book. That is awesome. I will put that information in the show notes so it's easy for them to find and click on and uh, go find your book. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Scott, this has been uh, this has been great talking with you today. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your book inside with us and t- talking to us about the the outfit and, and life and part of it. And uh, uh, it's great connecting with you and learning so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and Stephen, thank you and your listeners for listening to me and hearing 
because as you see why the book was named Inside, you get a different take on really things that were going on. Uh, I had it recently where I was on a mob panel with a mob historian. And I'm saying a couple of things to him. And he says, well, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, but you're a mob historian. You're writing all this stuff. I mean, he had written an article that uh, Sam Giancana and Joseph P. Kennedy talked before the 19, you know, during the 1960 campaign. And that's how the unions got to work for Kennedy. And I said, is that true? And after I told him, he said, I guess I had the wrong information. And I'm thinking to myself, it's a good thing my father wasn't here or else uh, you would have got more than the wrong information. You would have been in Mount Carmel Cemetery where if you want peace and quiet, if a guy wanted peace and quiet, my father said, oh, we can arrange it in Mount Carmel Cemetery. No one will be talking to you. You'll have all the peace and quiet you want. So yeah, that's why I did it. Uh, you know, because like I say, I've been with on panels on some things and these are people that are historians. They write crime report, crime reporters, but they really don't always know. Someone maybe is telling them something, but even the person that's telling them something, somebody's told them and somebody's told them, and they think they know. I've had a, uh, I was with a host in San Francisco, and uh, J uh, June DiMaggio, who is a niece of Joe DiMaggio, is uh, her mother's told her, "Well, I know who who killed Marilyn Monroe." And and I just sat quietly with the host, and I said, "Yeah, okay, you know, everyone has knowledge, and I will tell you, Stephen, this woman does not know." Who, unless the actual people involved told her, okay? And that's another story with Marilyn Monroe and her death. Another another story. I'm very aware of that. So, but I listened. And I said, okay, sure. And the host wanted me to come back, you know, in San Francisco. So we got to talk about this Marilyn Monroe thing. I said, yeah, okay. So, yeah, like I say, that's uh, why I tried to write the book, to try and show an inside perspective of what really went on. Because when you get uh, a crime reporter or historian, and they're interviewed on television all the time, they'll say, oh, he's a mob historian. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, probably what he knows, you could put it in a thimble and still have room. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> nice. Uh, this is this has been awesome. I've, I greatly appreciate it, Scott, and I wish you the best in uh, everything you do and uh, with the best with your book and uh, what you got coming forward. So good stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Like I say, it was my pleasure speaking to you and to your audience. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.